All right. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Welcome to The Turn from Reactionary Populism to a Progressive Alternative with Professor Jeffrey Sachs and Roberta Mongabera Unger. My name is Shannon Cobran. I'm an education manager with the SDG Academy, and I'm excited to welcome you to the second session of this three-part lecture series titled Losing and Finding the Way, the United States and Brazil. Before we get started, I just want to encourage everyone to please submit questions in the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and to remind everyone that you can find a recording of this session and all of the sessions in this series uh, at the SDG Academy Library, and we'll post a link for that in the chat. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Roberto Mangabera Unger to get us started. Thank you. Finding and losing the way. The United States and Brazil. I address American and Brazilian experience as variations on worldwide themes. The whole world now is connected by a chain of analogous problems and analogous responses to those problems. What is often labeled neoliberalism is the closest thing that we have now in the world to a universal orthodoxy. A universal orthodoxy can be successfully combated only by a universalizing heresy, as liberalism and socialism were in the 19th century. And these remarks of mine should be understood as a contribution to the formulation of that universalizing heresy. I divide my remarks into three steps. First, the comparison of these two countries. Second, their experience in the economy and in politics of losing the way. And third, what it would take to find the way. Brazil is the country in the United States, is the country in the world, most like the United States. These are two countries of almost identical size, one in the North, the other in the South, established on the same basis of European settlement, African slavery, and conquest of the Indian tribes. Each of them is the most unequal of its type, the United States of the rich countries and Brazil of the continental developing countries. And in each of them, this inequality is shaped by the intimate relation between class and race. The tendency of the Americans is to confront race but deny class. And the tendency of the Brazilians is the inverse. In the United States until recently, miscegenation has been limited. In many parts of Brazil, it was always pervasive. So Brazil has a, a more subtle, but nevertheless pervasive problem of racial oppression and discrimination. In each of these two countries, despite their tremendous inequalities and exclusions, the majority of ordinary men and women seem to continue to believe that everything is possible. There is the religion of the new. Living for the future as a way of living in the present, as a being not completely determined by the present circumstances of existence. A powerful source of this openness to the new is religion. And these are among the two most religious societies, at least in the West. In each of them, there is religious conflict and the enormous influence of a theomorphic idea of the human being. The human being shares in the divine attribute of transcendence. But the translation of this belief in the new, uh, in the hope of becoming bigger together, is limited in each of these two countries 
by a restraint of consciousness, a superstition. In the United States, that superstition has been what you could call institutional idolatry. The idea that the Americans discovered at the time of the foundation of the Republic, the definitive form of a free society, which has only to be adjusted from time to time under the provocation of crisis. We in Brazil have suffered from an equally grave but opposite defect, which you could call mental colonialism. The copying of foreign institutions, and to a large extent, the institutions of the United States. So that our institutions have been in a way like borrowed clothes, not, not suiting us. Now, losing the way. Uh, both of these countries have lost the way. But one of them, of course, was much richer and more powerful than the other when it lost it. Take first the United States uh, in the economy and then in politics. For the 30 years after the Second World War, there was rapid growth. Uh, initially, this growth involved initiatives on the supply side of the economy. For example, in the 1950s, the road building program, intimately connected to the development of the automotive industry. But for the most part in this whole historical period, from the Second World War to today, the basic driver of economic growth has been mass consumption. In the closing decades of the 20th century, from the 1970s on, the United States suffered a violently regressive redistribution of income and wealth. How did the Americans reconcile this regressive distribution with mass consumption? In part, they did it by the expansion of debt and of credit a kind of fake credit democracy put in the place of a property owning democracy. And this expansion of credit and debt was in turn further enabled by the structural imbalances in the world economy. The Americans sustained a capital and trade deficit, which was the reverse side of the Chinese capital and trade surpluses. And each of these countries used these structural imbalances as a way of escaping the imperative of internal structural change. A knowledge economy, a new advanced form of production emerged in the United States. Advanced manufacture, dense in technology and knowledge, and devoted to permanent innovation. But it emerged only as a fringe or as a series of fringes, excluding the vast majority of businesses and of workers. This insular character of the knowledge economy, of the new vanguard of production, became then a motor of both economic stagnation and economic inequality. The American elites were focused on the management and the reform of this fringe. And they started to debate, for example, antitrust or alternatives to shareholder primacy, the marriage of oligopoly and piety. But there was no project of disseminating the knowledge economy to all parts of the production system. Meanwhile, the vast majority of Americans were stuck in declining or retrograde forms of production. In politics, the American progressives and their party, the Democratic Party, failed to develop a sequel to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. They had no 
progressive approach to the supply side of the economy, no productivist agenda, and more generally, no institutional objective, no program for the renovation of American political and economic institutions. They had undoubted achievements in this historical period, but each of them was limited. There was the civil rights movement, but the civil rights movement in a form that separated race from class, unlike the experiment of reconstruction in the years immediately following the civil war, when there had been an ephemeral attempt to connect class and race. This idea of race as a threshold issue was then generalized into a form of identity politics, respect and recognition for minorities and for women. And that could have been an enormous contribution to democratizing the country. But it, if it were formed in a way that would lead back into the structural agenda, and they developed social entitlements. And once again, the entitlements would need to be part of any progressive alternative, but they were no substitute for institutional change. In this circumstance, the working class majority of the country, and especially the white working class majority, felt and was abandoned. And the formula of conservative statecraft became to combine material concessions to the moneyed classes and moral concessions to the moneyless classes. Uh, this formula wore thin. A demagogic populist was elected to the presidency. And then he had no structural responses to the structural problems. So the traditional American establishment has come back into power with no sign that it has today the project that it was lacking before. Now take Brazil. From 1870 to 1970, Brazil was one of the fastest growing countries in the world. In the middle of the 20th century, it established, it, it established in the Southeast an industrial base in the form of conventional industry, which was one of the great industrial parks of the world. And then it began to industrialize as one country after another in the world has. This was no longer the vanguard, it was the vestige of an old vanguard or a satellite to the new one, the knowledge economy. But the knowledge economy in an inclusive broad-based form seemed to be an inaccessible objective. The old shortcut to economic growth, conventional industry was blocked and the new one, an inclusive form of the knowledge economy seemed to be beyond reach. In this circumstance, the country and its business and political leaders took refuge in the riches of nature, agriculture, ranching, and mining with relatively little aggregation of value paid the bill of urban consumption. But a vast proportion of the population was confined to the informal economy, a shadow illegal economy, and in the formal economy, an increasing proportion in conditions of precarious employment. Meanwhile, a second middle class, an entrepreneurial petty bourgeoisie arose, and behind them, millions of workers still poor who had embraced a culture of self-help and initiative and tried to follow the direction of that vanguard of the emerging petty bourgeoisie. But without equipment, without opportunity, without a chance to continue their rise. 
in politics for the last 40 years, as Brazil has stagnated, the country was governed by center-right and center-left coalitions with two themes. One theme was fiscal discipline to win financial confidence and thus investment. That would always be necessary, fiscal realism, but not in the hope of winning investment as the reward of confidence, rather for the opposite reason, so that the country would not need to be on its knees depending on financial confidence, so that it could dare to develop a rebellious project of national growth. And the second theme was poorism, helping the poor. Of course, the poor had to be helped by transfer programs, but transfer programs were no substitute for a strategy of national development and for an institutional model in the economy and in politics. Then with the problems of corruption anchored in the relation between money and politics, in Brazil, as had happened in the United States, a right-wing populist came to office and is now lost trying to disguise the failures of his administration with culture wars. There you have the circumstance in these two countries of the majority of the population, the working population, finding no project on the other side that could lift it up, that could lift it up toward the vanguard, lift it up toward the future. And that then brings me to the third part of my remarks, finding the way, which anticipate our discussion in the last section last week. What would it take to find the way? First, it would take a productivist project, uh, not to multiply little Silicon Valleys, but to lift up the backward parts of the production system. In every sector of production, the Americans would have to find a 21st century equivalent to 19th century agricultural extension. Uh, they would have to develop a form of decentralized partnership between the government and the backward firms, a form that would be pluralistic and experimental. And they would have to encourage cooperative competition among these backward firms and workers dissociated from business organizations. The Brazilians had many of the instruments, development banks, extension services, Embrapa that had revolutionized Brazilian agriculture. What they did not have was a project. The productivist project is the first basis. The second instrument would have to be a democratizing project to create a high energy democracy that weakened the dependence of change on crisis. Institutions that would elevate the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular engagement in political life through new rules about the relation of money to politics and of political parties or social movements to the means of mass communication. Innovations that hasten the pace of politics by developing constitutional mechanisms for the rapid resolution of impasse, for example, through early elections, and institutions that could combine decisive initiative by the central government with radical devolution so that parts of the country under conditions could deviate from the predominant solutions and create counter models of the national future. 
And finally, an educational project. An educational project to equip the people with the ability to operate in a high energy democracy and in a deepened and disseminated knowledge economy. In these two societies, large, very unequal, and federal in structure mechanisms to reconcile the local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. And a new way of teaching and learning that would emphasize analytic and synthetic capabilities, selective depth rather than encyclopedic superficiality, cooperation in teaching and learning, and a dialectical approach to all received knowledge through contrasting points of view in both general and technical education. Now, how could such an alternative begin? An alternative with the productivist, the democratizing and the educational elements. It would require a progressive majoritarian coalition organized around an interest and around an ideal. The interest must be the interest of producers and of workers against the rentiers and the value subtractors. And the ideal must be the ideal of the enhancement of agency, of the ability to act, to approach every citizen as an agent to empower rather than as a prospective beneficiary to co-opt to equip with arms, wings, and eyes, the measureless life that wells up in common humanity, and to seek a society in which everyone has a better chance to die only once. Jeff. Thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful remarks. And uh, I will uh, join you in uh, trying to understand the puzzle, uh, the, the puzzle of uh, the United States and Brazil uh, having lost its way from what seemed a promising path for a period of time, especially after World War II, uh, which I will uh, call loosely the New Deal era. Uh, the New Deal era in the United States uh, is the period from uh, Franklin Roosevelt's coming to the presidency in 1933 to uh, the end of the Johnson administration uh, in 1968. This was a period of, uh, with uh, many uh, uh, footnotes, uh, caveats, and details of uh, an increasingly social democratic orientation uh, and a, a an impressive improvement in the quality of life and a direction that seemed very promising. Uh, even uh, it was an age uh, that was declared to be the end of ideology because it seemed that all America would become a middle-class prosperous society. Uh, it is the America that I grew up in uh, as a young person uh, in the 1960s uh, that, uh, fell to pieces. Uh, and it is extraordinarily important for us to understand what happened. Uh, I will put the puzzle in the US context in a very simple question. How did we go from Franklin Roosevelt to Donald Trump? Uh, from, uh, if not the sublime, uh, to uh, uh, the, the cruel, uh, from our greatest president uh, in modern history to a psychopath uh, as a president uh, that we uh, 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 just uh, barely survived and that has left the country uh, profoundly divided uh, and uh, absolutely uh, in, in deep crisis. I'm going to explain it in a different way uh, from uh, you, Roberto, uh, I view it uh, in uh, 
I'll, I will explain uh, how, how I view it, but I view uh, the problems uh, being more social than uh, either material or economic. Uh, and I view the backlash to the 1960s as probably the defining derangement of American politics. Uh, and uh, I think with the uh, strong results uh, in other parts of the world as well because of America's influence and because of what you uh, called uh, mental colonialism, the bad ideas from the United States easily permeated other countries, especially uh, a country like Brazil with so many structural and historical similarities as well as uh, personal uh, interconnections. So I want to show, as I did last time, uh, some, uh, some data that uh, to my mind is uh, extremely important uh, in this. And uh, I will start again with the puzzle from FDR to DJT. How did we get to Donald Trump uh, in this? Of course, it's not just Donald Trump. We had a period from Richard Nixon uh, through Reagan uh, through uh, George W. Bush Jr. to Trump, each time I said, could it be worse? Uh, we have a madman as president. Uh, how could we be descending in this way? So uh, do not uh, misunderstand the question as a question about Donald Trump. It is a question about American society that produced, uh, that produced the likes of Nixon, uh, Reagan, uh, George W. Bush Jr. Uh, and Donald Trump, all of whom uh, I find uh, to be uh, a blight on our modern political history, but also more importantly, a symptom uh, of uh, a breakdown of uh, a, a national approach. To my mind, uh, there are three fundamental demographic and cultural factors that uh, account for this. Uh, and I don't see this story as being one of economic failure in particular. I see it as being political and cultural failure to a much larger extent. But the three underlying forces that I think are uh, at play in American politics are first, the rise of the professional class or the knowledge economy uh, where uh, we see eye to eye. Second is the watershed of the civil rights movement and the civil rights era, a profound advance uh, in human decency in the United States, but against a, a backdrop of a profoundly racist society. And third, uh, the backlash arising from what is actually uh, a demographic change of promise in my view, uh, and that is the demographic decline of the longstanding white Protestant majority in the US, which gave special fervor uh, to uh, the likes of, uh, of Trump. So I would interpret the era after World War II, most importantly from an economic point of view, was being a science-based economy. The breakthroughs that came uh, through physics in the first half of the 20th century uh, and in mathematics uh, and in other areas of uh, basic uh, physical knowledge gave rise to uh, dramatic uh, developments uh, in the material economy. And the idea of uh, the new post-war economy was stated uh, by Franklin Roosevelt's science advisor, Van Iver Bush, in 1945 in uh, a brilliant uh, book called uh, uh, The Endless Frontier, uh, where he put forward the notion of a science-based civilian economy after World War II. Rather remarkably, Franklin Roosevelt uh, asked Bush uh, in 1944 to find ways to make the scientific advances 
of the wartime period, radar, uh, semiconductors, nuclear uh, energy available to the civilian economy. And Bush uh, rightly said that what was needed to do that would be a massive expansion of education, including education for the poor, a massive expansion of science funding by the federal government, including the what ended up being the National Science Foundation, and a kind of partnership between business and government to develop new technologies. The first great breakthrough that was directly building on the war effort was the invention or discovery of the transistor, uh, however you want to phrase it, in 1947, uh, which built on the semiconductor advances of 19. Uh, 41 to 45. Well, the transistor changed the world, of course, and combining the transistor with the advances of uh, cryptography and computation uh, led to the digital world that we now inhabit. Uh, so uh, John von Neumann, Alan Turing, uh, and uh, the uh, Bell Laboratories uh, basically produced uh, the digital economy. Uh, beginning in the late 1940s. I'm a materialist uh, in a view of uh, broad uh, social change uh, or economic change, I should say. I believe that this science-based uh, <coughs> economy gave rise to the new professional or knowledge class because what was demanded was technical skills. What was demanded was uh, professional management and administration. And there was a profound change in the occupational structure, basically uh, summarized by those with a Bachelor of Arts degree or higher versus those with a high school diploma or less. Up until 1945, the US economy was based on uh, eighth grade education to a very large extent. It was an industrial uh, and agricultural economy uh, that did not require much higher education. After World War II, the economy became based on higher education and advanced technologies. Now, during this period, because of the Great Depression era New Deal of Roosevelt, uh, and of course, Roosevelt remained as president uh, until April 1945. And then the continuation of the New Deal spirit, with a lot of exceptions, uh, for the next uh, uh, 20 years, we had a long era of what could be called American style social democracy, never as systematic as in the social democracies of Northern Europe, but one would uh, be hard pressed in the mid 1960s to draw a sharp distinction between even Sweden and the United States uh, at that point, because both uh, countries had similar uh, development of institutional structures. What happened though, was a breakdown of the New Deal consensus this is a, a metric uh, showing the political orientation of government in power according to a particular uh, methodology used internationally. And above zero means progressive or left, and below zero means uh, reactionary or right. And my argument is that we have had three periods in American politics since 1932. We had a New Deal era, which lasted uh, essentially from 1933 to 1964. We had a, a very messy interregnum period between uh, 1964 and 1980, uh, which was the civil rights era. And civil rights were uh, racial, uh, women's rights, uh, sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, so it was a tumultuous uh, period of expanding human rights, but probably the uh, deepest and most tumultuous from the American point of view was the racial 
uh, legislation, uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, 1968 uh, Housing, uh, Fair Housing Act, which ended a century of apartheid uh, governance or ended on paper a century of de jure uh, apartheid rule in the United States. Uh, the U.S. is in history one of the most racist societies uh, that has ever uh, uh, ruled. Uh, it uh, advanced uh, uh, slavery to uh, a remarkable extent and then after a brief period after the Civil War till 1877, uh, the brief reconstruction period introduced apartheid rule, uh, which lasted from 1877 into the 1960s. My argument is that what went haywire in the United States was the political backlash to the civil rights movement with the massive shift of uh, working class white voters not out of economic desperation at the time because it wasn't even a concept at the time, but out of a backlash to school desegregation, housing desegregation, uh, and uh, other civil rights era changes, and the religious right backlash to uh, the women's movement and to the sexual and reproductive rights movement led to a remarkable shift to right-wing politics in the United States, starting with Reagan, and we never got past Reagan. So I think we've been in the Reagan era from 1980 until the end of the Trump administration. Trump was a psychopath. Reagan was just a right-winger who catered to racism, uh, but uh, Clinton, did not create a progressive regime. He governed uh, as a center-right politician. George Bush uh, Jr. was a right-winger. So my interpretation uh, is not that the economy failed, but that society failed, uh, that we had a backlash to what was a working model. Of course, there are many other things to say. We had the Vietnam War, which was a disaster. We had inflation in the 1970s. But my interpretation is that the civil rights era provoked a, a change of US politics that has lasted until today and broke uh, the progress of social democracy. Now, I won't uh, belabor these points because time is short, but uh, I showed last uh, week uh, the changing occupational structure so that more than half of employment now is uh, in the management and professional class. Suffice it to say that the income earning gap between the professionals and the high school uh, educated widened enormously, but social democracy is designed to alleviate such widening if it is implemented. It does that in several ways. Uh, it uh, pressures wages from below uh, through measures uh, like collective bargaining or uh, boosts to the minimum wage. It ensures social services for all, like health care and education. It expands access to higher education because the United States got stuck at about 37% of young people completing a bachelor's degree, but it should be 50 or 60% as it is in Korea, for example, right now. But you require social democracy to open the doors of uh, uh, higher education to more people, and we didn't have that. The structural change in the economy should tell us that uh, we're, not, we're in a post-industrial age, of course. The service sector now is 80% of employment, the goods producing sector is 20%, and we're never returning uh, to uh, an industrial age because the goods producing sectors have been uh, automated so significantly that it's not that they're not uh, productive and significant in output, but that they don't need the workers. Uh, and so we are speaking about uh, services both advanced service sector and laggard service sector. Now, what happened in the United States 
is that social democracy died. It died with the civil rights movement, sad to say. And one can see this in the following. This is the rise of the share of taxation in GDP in OECD countries after 1965. Everywhere taxes went up to continue to expand the size of government, to make more family policy, to make more science and technology policy, to fund higher education with low or zero tuition, to ensure universal access to healthcare. But who didn't do that? Well, three English-speaking countries, Ireland, the United States, and UK. Partly that is Anglo-Saxon, John Locke, uh, neoliberalism. Uh, they each have their stories. The UK had Thatcher, we had Reagan. Uh, Ireland made itself a tax haven, so that's uh, yet a different story. But the point is that Europe went on with social democracy. The United States did not go on with social democracy. This shows up in so many ways in quality of life. The United States uh, has kept uh, the working class working round the year. Uh, 1,800 average hours of work per year, whereas Denmark uh, works on average less than 1,400 hours per year because you get the summer vacations, like academics do, by the way. Uh, and so it's a 400 hour per year difference with a 40 hour work week. That's 10 weeks less work per year in the social democracies. Uh, and I think that this is uh, part of the massive deterioration of health and well being of the American people that we did not share the benefits of a in high uh, productive economy the same way as in the European economies. Because of the collapse of social democracy, the United States became the most unequal of the high income countries, as uh, Roberto said. Uh, as Brazil is for the middle income countries, the United States is the most unequal for the high income countries. There's nothing intrinsic in this. This is because we do not have an active fiscal state which provides healthcare, education, uh, and so forth to all. And so we have huge inequalities and very low intergenerational social mobility in the United States. And in terms of well being, we have collapsed compared to other high income countries. We just released last week, the World Happiness Report, the United States ranks 19th. The countries where uh, life satisfaction, because that's the actual measurement in this study, uh, is uh, ranked highest according to surveys of uh, people asking about their life satisfaction. Finland, Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, all have much higher uh, life satisfaction than in the United States. So I don't think we have gained anything but anxiety, uh, deaths of despair, rising suicide rates un other than uh, as a result of this collapse of social democracy. So what happened, just to take a, a couple of minutes on the civil rights era, in the civil rights era, the white Southerners abandoned the Democratic Party and went to the Republican Party, which decided to become the racist party in the United States. This is a complicated story because the Democrats themselves were the half, half of it was the racist party in the United States, the Southern Democrats, whereas the Northern Democrats were the progressives. So the Democratic Party itself was deeply divided. During the New Deal era, most of the New Deal legislation from the 1930s to the 1960s was mainly about white people. And uh, African-American benefits under the New Deal legislation were much, much lower. It was when the Northern Democrats decided in the uh, weight of the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. and others to expand the benefits of social democracy to African-Americans, 
that's when things changed in the United States because the white Southerners who are racist, a racist culture for centuries and a brutally racist culture for centuries quickly abandoned the Republican, uh, the Democratic Party and swung the White House to the Republicans and to the reactionaries. And that's my interpretation of what happened. Of course, literally, uh, Nixon won the White House in 1968 on what was openly called the Southern strategy. And that was to court the opposition to the civil rights movement. Reagan campaigned in 1980 on states' rights, which is not even coded language for uh, opposing the uh, civil rights legislation of the federal government by diminishing the federal government and allowing local racism to rule. And this is my interpretation of uh, what happened in the United States and what we are continuing uh, to reel from. I showed you a political orientation chart. It's interesting that both the Democrats and the Republicans turned to the right. Uh, and uh, Clinton, we now see clearly, he governed as basically as a, a moderate Republican, not as a progressive Democrat. And we only have returned to, even in the Democratic Party, which is the blue line, to a more progressive agenda really in the 2016 campaign, which failed, and now in the election of President Biden in 2020, and maybe a swing of the pendulum away from the right-wing reaction. Now, in the United States, white, white supremacist right-wing reaction would not by itself govern. It governs together with the financial oligarchy. So the United States has always had a wealth domination and a racial domination in the right wing. That was the uh, governance of the American South. And it's been the governance of America since 1980. It broke the New Deal in two ways, along racial lines and along class lines, because uh, the arrival of Reagan was also a neoliberal reaction, but motivated and politically supported because of the backlash to the civil rights movement. Now, finally, let me say that religion enters this in a very particular way. The religious right, uh, which overlaps heavily with the racist white, uh, in the United States politics, but it's not the same, uh, is actually in decline as a share of the population. Uh, the white non-Hispanic share of the population has been in rather rapid decline since the 1960s. This, of course, is part of the uh, energy of the right-wing white backlash, the feeling that we're losing America and when Trump used the slogan, make America great again, which was, by the way, exactly the same slogan as Reagan in 1980. He was really saying to his followers, make America white again. And so this was a backlash against migration, immigration, and essentially a reflection of the white non-Hispanic population declining in share and feeling, which is true, that white non-Hispanics will become a minority of the US population by around 2045. And that's leading to political backlash. Perhaps an, an equal political backlash is linking that with Protestantism because it is white non-Hispanic Protestants which governed America almost completely uh, until recently. And the white non-Hispanic Protestant population was 60% uh, of the US in 1950, but it's declined to 30% of the population now. This is a profound cultural change taking place. The US is less white as a share of the population and uh, within the white population, less Protestant than before because many people have left religion or are now non-denominational. And the result of all of this
uh, in my view, is exacerbating this cultural backlash. So just to conclude, I, I uh, believe that an updated social democracy is uh, the right direction. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, I'm more optimistic because I don't see this as fundamentally an economic failure, but a social, cultural, political failure. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to say about that. The result of this cultural backlash is an economic disaster. Uh, it is massive inequality. Uh, it is uh, massive uh, uh, hurt and so on. But the roots of the backlash were not a backlash of the working class for lack of uh, prosperity. That's 40 years later as a result. The backlash came with the civil rights era, even during a booming period. So social democracy, in my view, did not fail. Social democracy was ended because the consensus for social democracy was broken. Let me stop there. So Jeff, uh, a, a fundamental division between us is on this question of institutionally conservative social democracy. Uh, in my view, the collapse of uh, compensatory redistribution was not the problem and its development now would not be the solution. So the most uh, characteristic uh, forms of redistribution that came out of the New Deal were the social security program on the one hand and the organization of the housing market and the mortgage market on the other hand. Both of them have ever since remained sacrosanct. They have not collapsed and that has not been the problem. Uh, and the progressives uh, then uh, had no program to master the new economic and social realities. They developed the civil rights movement in a form that dissociated race from class and antagonized the white working class. And they combined that with trying to use federal power and judicial authority to conduct a moral and cultural war uh, in favor of one agenda of values against another. Uh, and so those were powerful elements in the story. Now, rather than pursuing that polemic, let me ask this question. Where, can the United, where could the United States find inspiration for another direction now? One place in which it could find inspiration in its, is its own history and not its recent history, but its much older history. So take the first half of the 19th century in the period from the foundation of the Republic to the Civil War. Uh, against the terrible background of African slavery, what is it that built the United States? The United States was built because of the combination of two dynamics. On the top, there was Alexander Hamilton's project, which all the presidents of the United States down through Lincoln were loyal to. It was a project of nation building, of massive mobilization of resources to open up the country. But that would not have had the result if it had not interacted with the second dynamic below which was the selective democratization of the most important parts of the economy. And the most important parts of the economy then were agriculture and finance. So the Americans organized a form of entrepreneurial family scale agriculture, which had never existed in the world before to the same extent. And they did that through a series of bold institutional innovations from the Homestead Acts, the land grant colleges, the way of ensuring family scale agriculture against the combination of economic and physical risk. And in finance, they had a struggle over the control of finance, which culminated in the presidency of Andrew Jackson in the dissolution of the National Bank 
and the prohibition of interstate banking for more than 100 years. They then proceeded to organize the most decentralized system of credit at the disposal of the local producer that had ever existed. They were not regulating the agricultural or financial market. They were creating a, a financial and agricultural market that had never existed before. Uh, so it was this was the dynamic that actually built the country. Uh, and uh, then it was progressively weakened at later moments in American history. Now, why was it weakened? I think it was weakened because of the combination of weak politics with weak thought. Weak politics is a proto-democratic liberalism, uh, a, a constitutional design, a way of organizing politics that inhibits the transformative uses of democratic power. And weak thought is a series of movements in ideas that persist to today that naturalize the institutional background. There's a natural form of the market order. There's a natural form of democratic politics and so forth. That's the reality. Now, when the Americans needed to depart from this formula, they did. So you mentioned in passing the Second World War. In four years from 1941 to 1945, GDP in the United States doubled. That happened because there was massive mobilization of resources in the war emergency combined with radical institutional innovation. The economy was run on completely different principles and it worked. So the Americans were supposedly devoted to these sacrosanct principles of economic organization. When they needed to, they discarded it as if it were a mask. But uh, now we're back to business as usual. So uh, I think that, that, that we're, we're not going to understand this process by asking ourselves, why hasn't the United States become more like the European social democracies? Especially because those European let, social- Let me ask you, why? <laughs> because uh, that's, that's a good and fair question. Uh, my answer is because of the uh, racial, social, cultural uh, differences. But my view, uh, and this is where we are, we're at the end of the hour, so we will uh, move to exactly this topic uh, next week. Uh, in terms of uh, alternatives, I wouldn't, first of all, discard that experience because the quality of life is extraordinarily high in those countries and higher than it is in the United States and far higher than it is in Brazil. So it, it bids us to ask about that quality of life and how it's achieved. I also agree with you completely that the institutional innovations uh, are needed because we're in a different kind of economy now with a different technolo technological and material base. So when we look to the question about the future, we need to ask about a, a digital world. We need to ask about a world facing environmental uh, sustainability challenges and so forth. And that requires new institutions. So that's what we will focus on. Yeah. But I, so, I would broadly consider them still social democratic. Sure, sure. So just one word. Yeah, uh, uh, sure, sure. They're higher. The quality is higher because this redistributive mechanism, the entitlements, were the epilogue of decades of conflict over economic and political power. Uh, and then the, the public options and public services, the redistributive entitlements complement the institutional and structural consequences of those conflicts and don't replace them. Oh, I'm one, by the way, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, finding, we, do we continue to 1030? Is that, uh, is that correct? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm watching the clock and I have it completely wrong. No. So uh, my apologies. We have time to talk. That's why I have a little more time to talk. And then, I am, oh, and then I the so, deal is we have 20 minutes for discussion. I'm so I'm with, so sorry. I was thinking we were about to wrap up. So yeah. I apologize. That's why I was giving such strange, <laughs> strange answers that I forgot that we're going for 90 minutes, which which is a pleasure. So uh, let, let me step back then uh, 
you know, I think one point of difference, uh, clearly from a historical point of view, is how one would analyze the United States in the middle of the 1960s. Uh, was that a country in failure, uh, a country uh, in a uh, cul-de-sac, uh, or was it a country uh, facing, in my interpretation, the deepest wound and weakness of American society? which was uh, an apartheid society that needed, uh, needed, as you said, uh, well, I would call it a cultural revolution uh, and not an easy one. And you, you put it that way, that this was uh, using the federal force as, a, as an attack uh, against the structure of racism. And it was a cultural war uh, in a way. I think that that's right. Uh, by but, the way, but Jeff, but Jeff, now you're now you're combining the two themes: the theme of race and class, and the theme of the religious or cultural wars. By which I meant the conflict between the modernist or secular agenda and the religious or traditionalist agenda in sure. morals, in private morals. Okay, so but let me let me explain that because I think it's it's really worth uh, developing, which was. Uh, it, we, we had a cultural upheaval in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, which is not unusual, by the way, after a massive social, a profound social effort like World War II uh, and the Great Depression. Because during World War II, you had a mobilization of all of society, of women in the factories, uh, of uh, African-Americans uh, in the front lines of troops uh, and in the uh, military industry and so forth. And so after such a massive social mobilization, one cannot go back to a hierarchical, racist, patriarchal society uh, and expect that that is going to stick. And it is not surprising that it was in the aftermath of World War II that we had the beginnings of the civil rights movement, the desegregation of the army, uh, and then the beginnings of the desegregation of the schools and the confrontations in the 1950s, uh, and then the uh, massive uh, legislation following Supreme Court rulings of the 50s that came in the 1960s. This was a tumultuous period. And it was legislating morality in one sense. It said, uh, you cannot, even a private business cannot choose not to serve an African-American at a lunch counter uh, or to give a room in a hotel in a public accommodation. And to my mind, uh, or that your children uh, will go to school together with the, uh, with, with the children of uh, another race. And in American history, this was unconscionable to a significant part of American society. And the South had been built for hundreds of years on overt, blatant, vulgar, violent racism. And this was an assault on that. Sure. And sure. to my mind, it explains the change of politics and it explains the end of the social democratic era in the United States. Jeff, Jeff let's, let's, let's shift the setting yes. for a moment to Brazil, sure. which, has, which has gotten lost in, the, in yep. this last part of the conversation. So the, the most important social phenomenon in Brazil in the last decades is the emergence now of what some people call a second middle class. So it's a mixed race middle class. Unlike the traditional middle class, it's not focused on the liberal professions and on public employment or on European culture. It comes from below. It has a culture of self-help and initiative. The eyes of the Brazilian people, of the majority of poor people in Brazil are on them because they are the front line. And the desire of the people is to follow that direction. Now, uh, uh, many of them, 
maybe over half of them are evangelicals. We have tens of millions of evangelicals now in Brazil. Yeah. And there's a religious conflict in the country. So what is their desire? Their desire is not for handouts. Their desire is to have the equipment to be able to stand up, to create, to innovate, to rely on themselves. Uh, the, these center-right and center-left forces that have governed the country before Bolsonaro uh, gave no answer to their aspirations. And uh, then Bolsonaro is conducting a, a caricature look, caricature-like continuation of those policies. Financial confidence on the one side, handouts to the poor on the other, and then comes the third element of the culture wars. So th this is the fundamental problem. There's this huge vacuum and, and uh, there's, no, there's no response to their aspiration. In the absence of a response, what do they have? They have the traditional archaic 19th century form of retrograde, isolated family business. That's the default option. But, uh, for, you know, to my, to my mind, uh, this there's a fundamental question, uh, for example, about uh, standing on one's own, uh, which is a concept I don't believe in uh, in almost any context because I don't feel that we stand on our own. But crucially in the 21st century, even the idea of standing on one's own depends on uh, a, a, a successful educational of process. Course. And much and, more than that. Right, so but, but at least on education. And to my mind, call me old fashioned, but I believe in public education. So, uh, and, and so I believe in the role of the state in providing high quality education. Yes. And that to my mind, I call as part of the social democratic notion. Uh, and just because we may be using the terms differently, but the idea of a well-funded public education system as a fundamental part of a healthy society, I, I put under the rubric of social democracy. Absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, uh, so we don't, we but, even, we don't no, even absolutely necessary. Yeah. But, but absolutely necessary, but not to be assimilated to the 20th century model of institutionally conservative social democracy, which has now retreated to the last line of defense, high social entitlements, paradoxically funded through the regressive taxation of, of consumption, uh, and combined with so-called flexibilization of the labor markets, which in practice, has meant the consignment of an increasing part of the labor force to precarious employment in Europe. That's the reality. So yeah, it's, it's not the reality in Northern Europe, it's the reality in Southern Europe. It's becoming the reality everywhere. But, but I think that the, the point that I would say is that uh, you, uh, you characterize social democracy as compensatory transfers I characterize it much more as social consumption, meaning not so much the transfers to individual households, though they play a role, but a universal quality education, universal quality healthcare, universal quality vacation time for all workers, universal quality uh, access to uh, uh, training, uh, vocational uh, skills and so on. So I view it more as social consumption. When we look at the consumption basket in the United States, people spend a fortune on uh, things that they don't even spend on uh, in uh, Europe. It's not that the European households are receiving money for that. It's that you walk into the clinic or the hospital, you don't pay a bill. Uh, you go to university, you don't pay a bill. So I, I, don't, call that, I don't call I that compensatory. So that's necessary. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. 
because what we should want then is the multiplication of many forms of collective action. So standing alone should not mean individualism. Okay. Uh, standing up, it should mean being able to enhance your agency, which you can do only through cooperative action. And now the question is, in what political and economic forms are you able to do that? Will you, will you have the very restricted menu bequeathed by the 19th century? Uh, and then will its limitations be sugar-coated by a form of retrospective transfers? That's not good enough. So these societies in the new world, our countries, are societies full of human energy, of hope, the cult of the new, of the future. So answer it with, with, these, with these instruments. I hate to interrupt, gentlemen, but unfortunately, we're rapidly running out of time. And I want to uh, make sure we have a little bit of time to answer some questions coming in from our audience. Fantastic. Diana, it's not uh, our audience, it's our participants. <laughs> yes. And we'll have to pick this up again next week in, in our final session. Um, so a lot of really good questions coming in. I'm going to paraphrase very quickly. Uh, a number of questions uh, addressing topics that you both brought up about underlying values, um, morals, questions about uh, corruption. And so I'm paraphrasing here, uh, Roberto, you, you said populist leaders uh, don't come in with any solutions. Um, and Jeff, you also mentioned uh, the power of the wealthy oligarchy and financial institutions. So fundamentally, is, is this by design uh, that they, these institutions want to preserve the status quo um, is it corruption or just willful, willful ignorance? And how does that come into play here? Roberto, take it, take it away and I'll, I'll well, jump in after. So, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the brunt of the question. So uh, what is the motivation of those who rule? I think is the essence. Uh, is it uh, purely to preserve uh, privilege and power? Is it a misunderstanding of uh, the their role in society, uh, they're, they are, their action. They're, they're at the, uh, uh, unless they have some higher impulse or insight, they are at the mercy of the ideas that are available to them as well as of the interests. And so, and I describe what the two themes of our politics have been now for 40 years. The two themes have been balance the books to please the financiers, then there'll be a mountain of investment coming. That's theme number one. And theme number two is make it less terrible for the poor people by giving them a little bit of the leftovers. So that's, that's what it's come down to. And meanwhile, the country is rapidly going back to the 19th century with this deindustrialization, masked by the by occasional booms in commodity prices. This, this is a national calamity uh, in which the, the, a fundamental lack of, 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 of ambition, not just material ambition, but moral ambition. That's the fundamental problem. So corruption is a sideshow. You know, a, a large part of the Brazilian people think the major problem of the country is corruption. Brazil is much less corrupt systemically than all of the uh, major uh, continental developing countries. All of the others are companions in the BRICS movement. Uh, there is a problem of corruption focused on the relation of money to politics. Our real problem is abdication, abdication of a national program, uh, lack of imagination, lack of a response to this desire of the people to be lifted up. Roberto, let me ask you a question, if I could, uh, just to jump in. In, in my experience working in uh, South America, including Brazil, uh, and in East Asia, I find a very fundamental difference of perception, uh, which is in Asia, inevitably the conversation begins about technology. Uh, what's new? What's happening? How are we going to make money uh, can be part of it? How can we be competitive? And so on. In South America, in Latin America, 
uh, the discussion about the fact that the world is in massive technological change is not a very predominant discussion. There isn't a lot of angst typically we are not competitive in AI or what are we doing in the following new sectors? Uh, how do we get, I may be wrong or out of date uh, or missing the conversation, but the East Asian answer, and I do think there is a category there, whether it's China, Taiwan, uh, Korea, Japan, is we need to master the technologies because that's how we're gonna, make money, pay the bills, create new enterprise, be globally competitive, however one wants to define it. Whereas that motivation strikes me as very weak uh, in uh, the Latin American context. When you take that motivation, whatever institutions you choose for it, you're led to a different set of considerations. How do we learn that technology? How do we master it? Uh, which businesses should support it, state or private? Uh, how do we get our kids uh, trained and so on? Am I mistaken in that lack of uh, emphasis? Because to me, the, the challenge, one of the challenges in Brazil that I find very paradoxical is that it, it has had areas of technological excellence in areas of agriculture or in, in, uh, embry in embryo or others, but it's not a theme in society more generally, it seems to me. Well, that's true. And it's, it's, it's true because the country was diverted into the path of the easy riches coming from nature. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, and this, now seems to me something good rather than bad. Uh, there would be immense resistance in Brazil as there is and would be in the United States to the idea of a technocratic, plutocratic elite controlling a bunch of fancy gadgets, uh, making the workers superfluous and basically taking over the country, running the country as a kind of uh, advanced defense industry, like a big DARPA, uh, uh, and so uh, and that and that's something to which there is some inclination in the East Asian societies to which you just referred. This will not happen in the New World because we're open, and despite all of these perversions that we've suffered, there is a natural impulse to the mass of people and to their participation in whatever is designed. So I don't think we should think of the advanced economy as a set of gadgets. We should think of it as a set of practices and the institutions that can support them. And the question is, what is, what is the fate of that pro project? So yes, it's true that we don't have this technological emphasis, but we don't have it in the bad way as well as not having it in the good way. And we need something else. I hope that uh, we're not going to try and be tropical Sweden. Uh, and we're also not going to try and be uh, Singapore in the Western Hemisphere or Korea in the Western Hemisphere. But it's, but it's interesting, uh, by the way, I do tend to think of uh, economies, I wouldn't say more, I wouldn't call it gadgets, but I do think of it as technologies. Uh, and having the ability to design and produce semiconductors really makes a difference in this world. Of course. Uh, and, and so in that sense, I wouldn't uh, view it as uh, only the side effects and the fact that Singapore is at $70,000 per capita or 80,000 and uh, Korea at 30 some thousand. But Jeff, but Jeff, the deeper, the, I think the deeper way to think about technology is technology is the conduit between our experiments in the transformation of nature and our experiments in the way we work together. So the fundamental theme is the theme of an educated experimentalism and the participation of the broad masses of the people in that experimentalism. That's what we should want. And we in the new world, whether in the North or in the South, 
have the best chance of being the place for the emergence of that in the world. Shannon. Uh, all right, let's on to the on to the next one. I think a, a bit of a continuation both of this conversation and of something that was brought up last week. Um, you both in this conversation discussed the New Deal. I wonder if perhaps we could talk about the Green New Deal and the extent to which climate change or, or combating climate change can be this project of reform that we've been discussing. Great, uh, that, that will segue to next week, at least for me, uh, because I, I will put forward the idea that sustainable development as a concept is an organizing concept that has many attractions for me. And I find it convenient that sustainable development is SD, both social democracy and sustainable development, because I view them uh, as uh, at least cousins, uh, if not siblings uh, in, in this. But I would put it in the following way. The uh, uh, almost all protagonists in the economic debate uh, over the last two, three centuries have seen more more wealth, more income, more output as desirable. Uh, and then the debate has been how to achieve it. And we uh, have a, a deep problem with that because more uh, is not uh, either uh, a measure of our well being, so it's not a measure of ultimate purpose. And it's also not sustainable from a, an Earth systems point of view. It turned out that more carried out at the global scale has now become uh, extraordinarily dangerous, partly for completely accidental reasons, uh, namely that fossil fuels, carbon-based energy sources, which made the modern world economy, happen to have a side effect that the carbon dioxide that they release uh, absorbs infrared radiation and therefore warms the planet. It's a greenhouse gas. This is not a moral point. This is a, a, a quantum physics point that was discovered in the end of the 19th century. It means that our use of fossil fuels becomes dangerous after a point. That's hard to accept when the fossil fuels made the modern world and when there are trillions of dollars of wealth highly concentrated both at a national governmental level and in private capital in these uh, sectors. But that is why uh, moving to a different kind of energy-based economy has proven to be so profoundly challenging, not because we don't have good alternatives, sunshine and wind and uh, other things are really good alternatives. It's because of the concentration of power and how deeply embedded uh, carbon fuels are in our, uh, our economy after two centuries. So the point is, we face a kind of challenge that was not part of the debates of the 19th century uh, and only entered the public debates really around 1972, actually, uh, both with the first diplomacy and the limits of growth and the idea that there were limits uh, coming from the ecosystems. It's a new dimension that you do not really find uh, in uh, the older philosophical uh, or uh, ideological debates, because while human beings were perfectly aware they could destroy their local environment, no one ever dreamt of destroying the uh, global environment before, but now we're on the verge precisely of doing so without the consciousness, the traditions, or the institutions to address that. So sustainable development, like many other themes in the contemporary discourse, is systematically ambiguous in the following way. It, it could be interpreted as a diversion, uh, as a post-ideological or post-structural politics. History has disappointed us we find consolation in the great garden of nature. But it shouldn't be understood that way. It should be understood as a provocation to retake the agenda of structural and institutional debate in new form. And as we said last week, a green economy, a sustainable economy, 
is either primitive and merely extractivist, or it is highly advanced. There is nothing in between. But the way of making it more advanced is completely unknown. So for example, the project of the sustainable development of the Amazon for us is a project that requires everything to be invented. The technological, technical, economic, and legal basis of this project does not exist. And therefore the project has revolutionary potential to inspire us in the development of the national alternative to which I pointed. I think that's the perfect place to end this week because that is our topic for next week. Uh, and I concur 100% with that. What is going to be the institutional, legal, uh, technological base uh, for sustainable development, whether of the Amazon or of the planet, I think is a, a great uh, part of our discussion next week, Roberto. Very good. Well, I'll wrap us up then. So everyone, please come back for part three next week, April 2nd, uh, to hear the rest of this conversation. Please come back. I can't wait to hear the answers. <laughs> um, if you haven't signed up yet, we've posted a link in the chat. And you'll also receive a follow-up email directly from Zoom following uh, this session, which will contain a link to register for next week's session and also links to view the recording of this week's session and last week's session if you missed it. So please join me in thanking Professor Jeffrey Sachs and Roberto Mangabera Unger, and we'll see you all back here next Friday. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank see you in a week. Bye.